I want to discuss some financial ratios, specifically profitability measures, and then I'm going to show you how to compute them and also how you can decompose them to get a better understanding of what the company does and why they have uh, the profitability that they have. Um, the reason you look at ratios is that ratios allow for comparison. So for example, if your family owns a small hardware store, your net income is going to be tiny compared to Home Depot or Lowe's. But that doesn't mean that your firm or your, your small business isn't as profitable or perhaps more profitable than the big guys, okay? Because you've spent less money building your store than they have. They've spent billions building out, you know, hundreds or thousands of stores. Uh, you may be, you know, more profitable. They have more sales, they have more net income, but perhaps you're better at controlling costs and you're actually more profitable. So the three I want to look at here are profit margin, which is net income over sales, return on assets, which is net income over total assets, and return on equity, which is net income over total equity. So how do you compute these? So I have a um, a balance sheet and an income statement here and for the profit margin we just need the income statement. So it's going to be net income 893 divided by revenues which is the same as sales of 5,000 and it's 17.86 percent. So what you're doing here is saying hey we don't care how much you know, or let's say how much we sold or how many, how much revenue we took in isn't the only factor. What are the other costs that are involved? I mean, you can give away your product, right? And give it away at cost and make nothing, okay? You could have a profit margin of zero, but sell a whole lot, right? So, you know, when you produce something or when you sell something, you have costs, you have other expenses, you have depreciation, you have uh, perhaps interest expense, you have taxes. Okay, what's left over after all of that? All right, this allows us to compare the profitability or the profit margin of your company with, you know, a competitor or the industry average. Likewise with the return on assets, okay? Net income divided by total assets here 5606 so here you need for these two you need the income statement and the balance sheet again you may have be um, your hardware store may be generating a relatively small net income compared to Home Depot and Lowe's but you also are using a whole lot less assets so here it's 15.93 percent and the return on equity is net income divided by equity, which is the C slash S or common stock, 2,768. So that's 32.26%. So as I, I previously said, you can use these numbers and compare them to a competitor or the industry average. What you might like to do is actually decompose these. And there's something referred to as DuPont analysis. So if you decompose return on assets and return on equity, you can get a better understanding of where the numbers came from. And the this DuPont analysis comes from the fact that the chemical company DuPont started doing this analysis or this decomposition of return on equity around 1920. How do you decompose return on assets? Well, you have the formula is net income over assets but let's multiply it by sales over sales. Sales over sales, they just cancel. You're just multiplying by one. So it seems like this little mathematical trick. Uh, but what you're gonna do is rearrange the term. So now you have net income over sales, which is profit margin, which we previously discussed. And you have sales over assets, which is what we call asset turnover, total asset turnover. What does that do? That tells us how well you use your assets to generate sales. It's a measure of efficiency. So here we have return on assets as profit margin times asset turnover. And by decomposing these, we have a better idea 
as to how this firm generates its return on assets. So if you look to Michael Porter of the Harvard Business School, okay, an expert in strategy, he says, look, firms have to have a strategy. And there are two things they can do. They can, be a, they can follow a differentiation strategy or they can follow a cost leadership strategy. Okay? It's important that you understand who you are as a business and what you're trying to do. What's a cost leader? A cost leader can charge lower prices because the company has a cost structure that is lower than other firms. So it's not just about charging less. It's about the fact that it costs you less to produce it and you share a little bit with the customer so they get a lower price, but you're still more profitable. Okay, companies that are cost leaders are cost leaders because they tend to be more efficient. And um, they're more efficient in generating sales or managing their inventories. And that's how they happen to, you know, get this advantage. But they also usually are willing to accept lower profit margins. So here's a, a little illustration. So here we have... Um, you know, a picture. Here's the average firm. This is their cost structure. See how high it goes up? Over here is a cost leader. It doesn't go up as high. Your cost structure is lower. But you can charge a little lower price here and still have a higher profit margin. This height here is, is uh, higher than this one here. So that's what a cost leader does. You know, it costs you a dollar less to produce it. You charge 20 cents less to the customers and you make 80 cents more. Okay. The second approach is the approach of being a differentiator. So here the company differenti differentiates itself from its competitors by doing some things better, providing a higher quality product. Okay that people think is worth the money. And what they do is they earn more by charging more than the extra cost of differentiating their product or service. Okay, Having a, a, a unique product or a higher quality product isn't cheap. right? If you think about hotels, if you stay in a nice hotel, let's say a Marriott or a, you know Hilton, right? as compared to, let's say, a Red Roof Inn, you'll find that it's much nicer inside, right? The, the beds are nicer, the TV is nicer, they have a, a nice restaurant in the hotel, um, et cetera, right? You'll also find that the person working at the counter when you check in is usually well-educated, okay? Oftentimes, probably an MBA, you know? Now, they don't hire MBAs to stand at the checkout counter, but that's part of the training. Got to understand how the how the hotel business works before you move into management. And these people are well trained, so if you have an issue with your room, they can help you, right? If you say, well, something's not right, they might not charge you for the night, or they might give you um, something so that, you know, a coupon so you can have a free dinner in the restaurant or some free drinks, right? Or they'll give you extra rewards if you're a, you know, a rewards member for the hotel. If you stay at a Red Roof Inn, the person who checks you in, if there's a problem, what do they usually have to do? They have to walk in the back and say, I have to ask my manager, right? Well, having educated people at the front desk costs more money, but there are people who like that experience better. The beds are a little nicer, right? The rooms are a little bigger, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so that's what you're trying to do. You're trying to, you know, give people a better experience, right? Even uh, products that all seem the same, some sell for different reasons. If you want a car, you can buy a Subaru or a Ford or a Toyota, right? But if you want a status symbol, a Mercedes Benz or a BMW, you know, is an image. So, you know, they charge more for the image. It's not necessarily a better car. So here you can see that the differentiator has a higher cost structure than the average firm, but they're able to charge more and so they make a greater profit. So this area is bigger than this. So that's the idea of differentiating. Okay? Certain products,
people will pay more for, right? I'll, I'll pay more for a Mercedes just because people think it's a great car. It may not even be as reliable as a Subaru, but you know, if I drive up someplace in my Mercedes, people will look at me and perhaps hold me in higher esteem because that's what I'm driving, okay? How do we decompose return on equity? Well, we do the same tricks we did before, and we do one additional trick. So I'm just going to jump to the bottom line here. So we multiply by sales over sales, and then we multiply by assets over assets. In the end, we get net income over sales. This is profit margin, which we discussed before. Sales over assets is asset turnover, which we discussed before, and assets over equity is referred to as the equity multiplier. It's a measure of financial leverage. So here I've written this out for you, right? So profit margin times total asset turnover times the equity multiplier gives us return on equity. By breaking it down, we get an idea as to What's happening to return on equity? Why, why did it go up? Why did it go down? Okay, Increases in profit margin are good. right? Increases in asset turnover are good. That's a measure of efficiency. But increases in the equity multiplier or financial leverage might be a problem and might be an indication that the firm is increasing its risk of bankruptcy. So let's take a look at Apple now. I don't want to infer that Apple is in any way, shape, or form on the verge of bankruptcy, but let's look at their return on equity, right, from 2013 to 2022. You can see it's risen quite a bit. Why did it rise so much? Profit margin, uh, especially these last two years, went up a little bit, okay, not bad, but didn't go up that much. Asset turnover, okay, these two years went up a little bit, okay, but if you look at financial leverage, 1.68 to almost 7 here, that's a huge jump, and that's the reason their return on equity is so high, because they're using a lot more financial leverage. Now, you know, this is a company that probably can afford to take on more financial leverage, but when you look at return on equity, you want to understand that. You don't want to get just too excited because you go, oh, look at their the jump in their return on equity. They're not, let's just compare 2013 with 2020. Let's see, their asset turnover here actually got a little worse. Their net margin actually got a little bit worse. But the amount of leverage they have is like three times higher and this is why you see a much higher return on equity. So, you know, ratios are a great way to examine companies and to um, do comparisons. And in the case of these profitability measures, if you break up return on equity and return on assets, you can get a little better understanding of the company.